All right, oh, planet Earth. Welcome to another Friday edition of Q&A with Alan and Marshall and our best buddy, Nate, this week. <laughs> so, What's up, uh, world? How's everybody doing today? Please leave a comment. Let us know where you are, who you are, and later we're going to get into the show with some questions and stuff, and we really want your participation. So this week, don't just sit there and watch. <laughs> we want you to participate. And you can do that right now by sharing that you're watching. Right? That's yep. really important. We want all of your friends to let uh, to know that what we're what's going on today. So please click that share button. So how are you guys doing, Alan and Nate? Um, I'm doing well. I was, uh, as we were saying, I was way up in northern Michigan in Traverse City. And speaking of people that listen and never post, uh, Josh at Gen T's, I know you're listening and never post. Here's your shout out. But uh, it's always good to hear people. Um, Don't and hear it's, them. And it's awesome that uh, they, uh, you know, he listens. Sometimes he can't during the day live, but he'll go back and listen in, to the recordings. So oh, that's great. Uh, that's awesome. So if you're going back and watching, please leave a comment that you went back and watched. Absolutely. Especially on YouTube. We'd love to get more YouTube comments, and that yep. can help. <laughs> And our YouTube numbers are going up, so that's they cool. are they're awesome. exploding actually. So yeah. our numbers are good. So. so Nate, you haven't said hello yet, so let's get something from you. Hello, world, and everyone watching. Uh, happy to be here, but yeah, I'm coming to you from uh, snowy Ohio, and uh, yeah, it seems to follow me wherever I go right now because I was just in Kentucky two weeks ago for three days and I uh, went down there and it was wonderful and warm. And then they had a massive snowstorm while I was down there. So <laughs> uh, it's chasing me and, uh, but we're making it through and uh, hopefully warmer weather's coming. They had mostly, I uh, thought Nate this week, they had a big ice storm down there also. Well, stay oh. away from Mesa, Arizona, please. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. You have like nine inches of sunshine today. Is that it? Uh, you know, um, I'm not really sure. I haven't been outside because I've been working. It's uh, it's, it's 63. Today. So I'm st I'm wearing shorts. You know, I'm flying to Bozeman, Montana on uh, Monday, so uh, I have to go find all my uh, my gear. Your northern wear. <laughs> so uh, I haven't really been using it here in Arizona. So uh, going to uh, Colin's shop at Lone Mountain. Yep. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so let's see. Let's say hello to some people. So Sean's working. Uh, looking. Excuse me. Uh, he's supposed to be working, but he's looking. <laughs> TGIF. Cindy's here, of course. Freezing cold in Texas. Did you go to Texas, Nate? Because they had this massive snowstorm, and there's a huge like pileup in Fort Worth. A bunch of people died because they don't have to drive on the oh, ice. My. No, I stayed away from there. That one wasn't my fault. And Jeremy says your uh, your your beard is strong. Jeremy, what's up, man? He's got the uh, lumberjack going. Keith's here. Good morning. Kim's here. Good morning from Oklahoma. And Kim's moving to Phoenix. Yeah. So uh, happy to see that. What up, guys? Whoever that person is. You got so to type in your name. You have to give permission you for us to let you, uh, let uh, us know who you are. By the way, Heather's here. Good morning. Hey, Heather. Speaking of Kentucky from Cave City, Kentucky. Yeah, Heather, Brian says, hi from cold Missouri. Even colder yeah. with a broken shop heat system. Turn on the dryer. Yeah. Matt's here. Hey. It's three degrees in Denver. Mm. The beard game in this room is on fire. Here you're <laughs> coming in. What's up, guys? Uh, Yost is here. Hi, all. It's negative 22 there in Sweden. So he That's wins. Celsius. He wins. Oh, it's Celsius. So what is that in Fahrenheit? Who, who's who got the calculator? My phone's off. I can't check. <laughs> Nathan must come into Texas. It's 19. We're supposed to have a record-breaking snowstorm. <laughs> what up, fellas? Lots of ice in Kentucky. And then Garrett says, nothing better than the middle of the day in February when your conveyor dry heats the shop up. Absolutely. Garrett Evans from Holly, Michigan. So. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I was in Milwaukee for a while, and uh, I'll be completely honest, I don't miss the snow. You know? <laughs> yeah. Don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I moved there, I didn't have any socks 
that went past my ankles because I'm <laughs> a Florida guy, right? And uh, I had to like buy stuff because just to survive. <laughs> oh, thank. So um, anybody who doesn't know me, I, I knew a few of those names, but if you don't know me, ask me whatever questions you want because I'm a, uh, I'm really open to that, <laughs> and I try to explain them well because. Right. Richard Greaves challenged me about a year ago with uh, knowing the why of everything instead of just <laughs> knowing that that's what we do or that's how you should do it. So I will do yeah. my best to answer anything that anyone wants to know. Yeah. When Richard challenges you, that's something you have to do. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so Richard challenged me. When you, you, Marshall, you realize that you say the word right after like every sentence? I'm like, that's correct, right? <laughs> so Richard, knowing him as long as I have, he has he has the opportunity to yell at me when I need to. So about five years ago, he calls me, he goes, all right, we're friends. But if we were there, I'm going to be the dad and grandfather. He goes, right now, I'm going to reach over and pat you on the hand. But, and he just kind of said, what the freak were you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> I'm there, so. Right. So uh, who else is here? So uh, Mike's here. Hey, Mike. Uh, there's our answer. Ooh. Negative six, Somebody's seven. We still answer. don't know who you are. You got to sign in. Oh, there, there we go. go. I got it. Everybody's, everybody's doing the calculations for us. Thank you. Charles is here. Hey, y'all. Uh, morning from Grand Junction, Colorado. It's 45 and rainy. Thanks, Shane. And then Yosta commented also. So thanks, guys. Negative 7.6 Fahrenheit. Not so, good. Let's hit the ground running with our first topic. What do you say? Do it. Maybe we ought to say who late who Nate is actually. Yeah, who the hell are you? I don't know. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> no, my, if you don't know me, my name is Nate Leber. Uh, I own a company now called Leber Design and Print. I have been in the print apparel game now for I'm going into my 11th year, which wow. I don't feel like I'm old enough for that to be possible, and yet here I am. Uh, so yeah, I started in 2010 and first thing uh, I got out of college in the recession and there were no jobs and I had two art degrees. And so I kind of bounced around for about a year or so and finally landed on, I picked up a job as a reclaimer at a really large, uh, spirit wear shop for, I think it was 925 or 950 an hour. And, uh, you know, you get that college degree and that fancy piece of paper and you're not real happy with that then. And you're like, OK, I need to change this. So I decided I was going to be the best reclaimer they ever saw. Um, and so I worked my way up through that company for about four years. And then uh, Headhunter tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I wanted an opportunity. And I'm like, this is weird. What is this? But let's see what it is. And uh, long story short, uh, they hired a 26-year-old to manage uh, a pretty large uh, fashion apparel company uh, that, yeah, if we want to go into that more, we can. But yeah, they, they at the age of 26, I became the plant manager of a fairly large screen printer. And I was there for five years and then started my own shop in uh, 2016 and worked simultaneously at those two for a couple years before going 100% out on my own in 2018. And now here I am. And Nate has the distinction of being the first Shirt Lab host shop from our yeah. uh, inaugural event in Columbus when we had it there. And he really helped us out with that a lot. And um, so we, you know. That event was awesome. <laughs> that event was awesome. There's a lot of good takeaways from that one. I still have yeah. the notes. So, uh, all right. So let's, let's, get, let's get some stuff fired off. And your whole career has been in Ohio, right? It has. It, in fact, the majority of it has been in the Columbus region. Everywhere I've worked right. is within 12 to 15 miles of each other. Right. One of and, the little known things about Columbus is it's the third largest fashion hub in the U.S. After New York and L.A., Columbus is yeah. third. So we have a lot of big corporate brands here yeah. and a lot of uh, fashion apparel designers. I think Atlanta's giving you a run for the money. Hey, they can try, but hey, we're we're just sitting strong here, so uh, yeah. we'll we'll so, try to compete. Uh, and what uh, an interesting fact is that the reason the first shirt lab, our live event was in Columbus, is because Nate talked us into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did. Hopefully, hopefully that worked out good for you. But uh, but yeah, I did talk you into it. I sold I sold Columbus, and I love Columbus, and I'm a big advocate. Yeah, it was it was a great event, and we loved it there. And I, I'd yeah. never been to Columbus before. Uh, lots of fun. 
So uh, if you haven't been to Columbus, you should go. There was some good, a good stuff. Study. Um, so let's get the first thing going, which is all about customer challenges, right? And I think Nate, you had something to say about this. So let's get let's hear from you. Yeah, because you printed huge brands for this one company. When I first met you, Nate, you were with a company managing the shop in large runs, just two presses, but monster presses, printing large brands for Abercrombie, Forever 21, et cetera, et cetera. So that comes with its own challenges, I'm sure. Yeah, it does come with its own challenges. Yeah, some of those companies were, were very big and everyone's heard of them. And, you know, something everybody wants to or says they want to print for those brands. Um but you got to realize when you get into them, there's a lot of extra steps that go with them. Um, number one is straight up contract printing. So you need to be yeah. be tight and be efficient to begin with because the margins are are lower than retail printing. That's just one challenge. But another thing that people don't understand, which takes an incredible amount of time, knowledge and people, is that when you work for a facility like that, every single order that you do is sampled first and then has to go back up to corporate for approval. So it takes a long time you need to have some kind of either transportation or courier doing that. But more importantly, you got to know all the ins and outs of the garments, of what it's made of, of the inks, because these designers, they would send us all kinds of apparel. I remember on at least three different occasions, they would send us swatches of fabric saying, we've sent these to other shops that can't be printed on. Okay. And so you're, you're contacting the people that are making the fabrics to find the makeup of it and to really dive down on a more uh, scientific and technical level to find out what it is, how it's made, how the dyes were set in it. That way you know how then to decorate it and, and what to do with that. And then on top of it, you get all these specialty techniques. So that's just one portion of it. So you sample everything, you send it to them, you wait for approval, then you do the run. So meanwhile, you can't sit around and do nothing. You have to have uh, things making money. So you know, we we had 16 head presses and people are like, man, you, you guys printed 16 colors? Well, no, not really. The goal was to always have two presses running with production all the time. The third one was always sampling. And then you could rotate around by having multiple jobs set up in each press. And that way you could still be going efficient, but still doing sampling. Um, certain so, companies and shops don't sample on their presses, but we always sampled on the press we were going to run it on because I wanted it to match perfectly every mm -hmm. time. And, and the thing about doing retail at that level is that every shirt run that you're doing has to match what's in the store. So there's a yeah. there's a high bar of it has to be perfect every single time. You got to dial in the recipe because uh, in three weeks, you're running another batch. that has got to match the one that's sitting out there. Otherwise, there's massive chargebacks and you're screwed. <laughs> there is. You, you get chargebacks when it's in contract printing and you're in the negative. Instead of getting paid, you're paying back in. So we had a shop standard of a 1% scrap rate. Um, and we never hit that because we were adamant about it. When you sample units like that, you have to send a certain amount of samples up to them. Uh, it goes to their marketing. It goes to the merchants. It goes to each department that needs one. But you also keep one. So we would keep one then. And that way we'd have that sample there. Then when we went to actually fire up and run the job, the tech or the operator had to print us off then a sample, the first piece sample. And we would actually physically hold them up and compare the two. So then the first one, our keep sample, hung up at the front end of the press where the offloader was. And the second one, the approval piece then, hung up for the dryer. So people had eyes on them all the time because it, it can't fluctuate, it can't shift. And then we would internally keep those samples. We would have to catalog and store them uh, in a locked and secured place because uh, brand protection was such a big deal there mm -hmm. that then in two or three weeks, if it was something that ran hot, the brand would come back to us and they would be like, we need these in stores in five to seven days and it might be 30 or 40,000 units. So. So you set everything back up again and go, and it yeah, it has to match perfect. And what's really great about having you on today is because Alan and I talk about documenting your processes, I think pretty much all the time. All the time. <laughs> and, and you are living proof <laughs> of the reason why you need to do that, right? So why not just kind of talk about that real quick about your system, like the form you use and the mm -hmm. questions and this you know, the recipe that you're writing down so you can hit that again in a couple of weeks. So we had a document we made and still use um, something similar to that, but ours is simplified now. But basically we would create a document 
that you put your entire print order in, but we would also put your flash order in. You would put in what heads had cooldowns in them. It would include um, mesh counts, specifically if we had something that wasn't our typical EOM, that may, may get calibrated in there. And we got so kind of dialed into it and the nuances of things that would change. Like I actually had one really good sample technician. He started uh, documenting even the temperature and the way the day was. So that way, if it was a really dry but cold day in the winter, and then we got a reorder in the summer, which was hot and humid, we we would know, okay, our whites aren't going to quite print the same way. We either need to slow them down or speed them up and, and adjust for that as well. So literally every possible variable that we could try and measure, we, we did try to measure. Um, mm -hmm. That was key for us. So we would put that um, in a digital version first. We saved all that, and we had backups of that. But we would also physically print it out just on our normal uh, shipping label printer, a little four by six, stick it directly on the sample. So then that information was there on the sample and could go right back out to any technician that may be setting the job back up. You know, typically when there was a reorder, the sample information would go first to ink. They would start mixing and screen room would, would go next. And then everything, as you've talked about a lot, would get kit packed up, go right out there. And then the technician would put it in and run it. But all that information was always there and available to everyone, but it was also saved digitally, but also physically available. That way, everyone could get it at any time. Yeah, it's great. So I, uh, in Shirt Lab Tribe yesterday, we did a presentation with Mark uh, Suodalnik with GSG about printing with specialty inks and stuff. And we were talking about documenting uh, yeah. what you do so you can match the whatever crazy thing you invented. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot of people don't really do a good job of that. And so when they try to figure out what they did, uh, it's they spend more time with trial and error trying to like figure it out than if they just wrote everything down. Right. And, well, and it, it starts mattering so much when you get into the, the really high end specialty stuff, like yeah. what Mark is doing, but you get into like high density and things like that. You know, you got to document your EOMs and how you achieve yeah. that print to get that height like that. Because if you're yep. printing for a big brand, they're not going to accept it if it doesn't match the second time through. And and they are wild enough to a merchant will pull a sample out or audit you, and they may even take a tape measure or micron reader and measure that to to see how close it is. And mm -hmm. their uh, their tolerances are are very small. Um, like just one tolerance we had was in placement. Our placement, we had a variance of plus or minus a quarter of an inch. You know, so a half inch mm -hmm. total that it could be off by. And if it was out of tolerance, it was scrap. So, so um, let me, and so uh, the reason why these brands do that, right, is because they don't have to pay you or you get a penalty, but they're still selling the shirts. So doesn't it become a kind of a profit center for them? Well, <laughs> They, they weren't supposed to ever sell the scrap. We, we were supposed to package the scrap separately and send that back. In sure. When, they, when they, you, they have a bunch of shirts you ship to them and they get mm -hmm. rejected, do you get them back or do they just sell them anyway? They are not supposed to. They're supposed to send you a receipt of incineration is what they were supposed to do. And sometimes they would do that and sometimes they would not. And you would wonder are they going to Marshall's or things like that, you know, and, yeah, right. and I don't a hundred percent know the full honesty in that. Sometimes uh, certain brands were very clear about it and were very good to work with and they would show you those things. Other times it wasn't as much. And so a lot of it just depend on the openness <laughs> and honesty of who you were working with. And right. usually more than anything, how good of a relationship you had with them and their right. merchants. Right. So I think this really uh, begs the question here about understanding uh, the expectations of your customer. And of course you're dealing with what, with that particular retail customer and people watching right now, they, they might have their own customers and their own set of challenges they're having to navigate through. So Nate, can you give me an example of how you kind of help uh, get that relationship going um, and maybe get the clarity that you need to understand the expectations of what is, what does success look like, but also what does failure look like? And you know that that's going to get rejected or there's going to be a problem. And let's talk about it now before that happens. What have you done? Well, number one, most importantly for us more than anything else is just building that relationship, making sure you have open and honest communication with those people. Um, I like to get people as close to production as possible talking with the actual buyer or the merchant. 
I'm, I'm not a big advocate for having a lot of rounds of CSRs and middlemen because right. it seems things start yeah. seeming to get confusing and the expectations are not known. Now, the other thing, you know, to always do is everybody has mock-ups and approval mock-ups, but put a lot of information in there, you know, make sure you have uh, Pantone standards, make sure you put placement in dimensions, make sure you put art sizing in dimensions. That way it's very clear exactly what is going to be given to them. That way when it comes back later on, they're like, oh, what is this? You know, a lot of times I see digital mock-ups that um, are just on like a vector drawn template or anything, which is fine, but it doesn't have any kind of dimensions on it. It doesn't have any anything like that. And it doesn't uh, really look like what the final product is going to look like. So I think making sure our mock-ups look very accurate which is an internal thing, but then also giving the customer those external things, you know, making sure they understand what Pantone swatches are. And then, you know, we'll, we're the professionals on that. We'll make sure that we match back very, very closely to that. Um, but just letting them know the expectations up front and building that relationship and open communication with them. Yeah, that's so important. And uh, the other thing that uh, as an ex art director, right, I put is that the image is on a size large shirt. Mm -hmm. And so if it's supposed to be 12 inches wide, it looks like it's going to look on the shirt. Right. And uh, because, you know, it's going to look different on a small than a 4X. Right. And Absolutely. so you want to kind of give everybody the, the instance of how that's supposed to look. And I always use from the bottom of the collar, like that dimension is three inches down or four inches down or whatever it is. And that's the expectation. And that is really great, especially for your print crew, because now they know how to load the shirt, right? Something we also do uh, more recently um, is we make a lot of videos now explaining Pantones, why it's important, the, the uh, reasons why colors may shift or look different based off color correction mm -hmm. of monitors or even lighting. Um, you know, a specific brands that I worked with, they were so adamant about that. They, they told you at the shop and there at their home office, they said, we're going to view this under incandescent A lighting. That's how dialed in they were. And so we don't, we don't take things necessarily to that level now, but just explaining to the customers up front now that there are these variances and here's why based off your monitors and if they're color corrected or not, which no one's ever are at home. So yeah, yeah. So all that stuff's important. This brings up my new favorite tool, which is the color spectrometer. Did you ever use one of those? Yes. Yes. Oh, man. If you got the cash for one, they are amazing. Yeah, it, it, it's 300 bucks now. Really? Yeah, I got one right here. Let me show it to My you. My goodness. We might have to snag one of those. Did a, uh, him and Jesse Martinez did a video together um, showing it off. It, it was pretty cool. Who, what brand makes it? It's called Spectra One. Hold on. I got okay. it. Here. Yeah, it's not the base. I, I just went on a trip and... Uh, Normally, I keep it on my shelf. So this is the case it comes in. Nice. And it had, they have a license with Pantone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what's really cool about it, it's about the size of a big, fat lipstick. Okay. Wow. It's Bluetooth. They there have an app cool. on your phone. And you can you can click, uh, and it'll tell you. you know, like you just put it on the thing, and you go, and it tells you what the Pantone color of whatever you are looking at. Ooh. And also, if you you can measure against the Pantone book, right, and it'll tell you how many delta E that you're off from the Pantone color. Well, that's so cool. The, the thing that I would say is you want to be within um, three to five is kind of acceptable because that's what the human eye can see is color difference because we're all different, you know. Right. Uh, and then, uh, so how far, what is your tolerance? So you, if you're a professional and you're charging for Pantone matching, this is something that you need these days mm -hmm. because you have the ability to measure the color and scientifically, it's not your opinion, right? Measure the color and say, hey, I'm matching this to this level. Mm -hmm. And then if it doesn't match, then you can change the squeegee durometer or change the underbase color or whatever you got to do to dial it in better. Because we all know that some colors are harder to hit the, you know, Absolutely. like blue over white, you might mm -hmm. need to use a gray under base or like PMS 202. You know, if you used white underneath, it's going to look pink, right? If you do enough of this stuff, you know, the colors that always suck. Right? Yeah. Well, and of course it changes based off your ink mixing system too. One, 
one you'll see has certain variances and others go other way. So what we've done a lot basically though is make videos explaining that, that way we have a big bank of them yeah. already there. And so now when we are starting to work with new customers and new brands that aren't familiar with us and our processes yet, right. we can just start sending them those. And it's really easy because A, everyone's moving towards video, but also now that everyone's at home, it's really easy to send them a video because we're not getting as much face-to-face -face interaction anymore. Right. Alan, what do you think? You, you're pretty silent. Well, I'm listening because we're into the color spectrum thing, um, which is not usually the circles I run in. So I'm learning here. Um, you know, here's, um, the, here's the website. My question, you, my question that get I had to, if, was, as Marshall and I were talking uh, before, and he showed me this, the to tolerance of the human eye is three to five delta E is off on color. My question was going to be on the brands you worked with when you were printing for those brands, did they have a, a tolerance of color of delta E's that could be off? No, <laughs> no, they didn't have a tolerance, a measurable one. It was, you looked at everything under a light box under that same light and you would take mm -hmm. um, the Pantone chip out and place it beside it. And so it was, you know, does it match back to that or not? Got yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. So it was a little bit subjective too, which mm -hmm. could be frustrating. You know, we, we would get um, odd requests from brands like that where they will, you know, literally say um, a red is casting two green. And you're going back to the formula. There's no green in it at <laughs> all. And, and you're just trying to see, okay, what, you're really trying to decipher what is this merchant telling you and trying to find what they're looking for more than anything else. Too green as the merchant is colorblind. He means too blue. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, Ray, by the way, Ray and uh, Nate are going <laughs> to have a beard battle. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Ray, I think Nate's giving you a run for the money. I'm in. Uh, I'm in. Ray says, knowing the LAB and what the delta is off will tell you the direction, too light, too blue, too yellow, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's it's really good. It's good information, right? Okay. And uh, let me tell you, it, it, if I was in a shop now and I'm not, you know, I would have one of these gizmos and I would be, I would have my process down. I would be working. This is like my new favorite thing that I've been showing people. And that's why I spent the money because I'm so enthusiastic about it, as you can tell. <laughs> so. Well, that price too is is affordable. I've I've had friends that have the older ones, so I always have to send it off to them to have them measure right. it for me. But yeah. uh, for that price, that's yeah, any shop can afford that. Right, right. Um, then, Marshall, there's a uh, Keith Burwell posted about the older oh. ones, and uh, Nate you probably relate to that. Right there, Nate and I are familiar with a larger Spectre machine. They're about four thousand dollars plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is Bluetooth works with your phone. Yeah. That'll $300 work. is very manageable. Right. Hold on. I can bring up the app. Hold on. Get my phone fired up here. And because um, it it keeps in its database the, the last thing you recorded. Right. Um, so you guys talk while I figure out what the hell I'm looking so at. So if we're talking about color mixing, something interesting to note too, if you want to get into printing for those big brands and color is especially once you get maybe more into like licensed stuff, these brands will pick, uh, the designers pick custom colors yeah. to bring yeah. branding, you know, to, yeah. to it's, <laughs> it's, it's odd, but they, they pick these colors that they could just pick a Pantone, but they want them to be quote unquote custom. And so then you may have to um, strike swatches and match back to it long right. before you ever get to actually run mm -hmm. too. You may be doing that weeks or months just trying to get your orange approved. I mean, so here's, let's see if I can see it, right? So here's the app. This is comparing a printed sample of 186 to a 186 swatch book. And I don't know if you can see, it gives you the LEB variables underneath mm -hmm. it. This was slightly over at 6.68, yeah. right? So you can see in the uh, upper part, where's my finger here? Right here, it says standard. And then right here, it says sample. That's right? cool. And That's uh, cool. So, so if I was on the floor, I could say, you know what? How can we dial this in a little better mm -hmm. so it's under five, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, so that's like the power of this thing is really, really giving you 
a basis for having really good communication with your customer about color, mm -hmm. right? And, and if they have the same tool, then we're all talking the same thing. Right. It isn't subjective anymore. It isn't the fact that, you know, because you're different than your customer. And right. he's going, well, I don't really think that matches. Yeah. Now we've got a number. Mm -hmm. okay. An actual standard to get back to. Well, yeah, think, that's what I really like about it. So I think dealing with brands like that, I remember one of my first early meetings with Abercrombie, uh, they were discussing their brand and stuff. And I just said, wow. Because I knew printers that were, you know, they don't, they get in printing for Amber Crombie around the Ohio and Columbus area. And you know who they are, Nate, because they're gone now. Um, they don't realize the testing, the test printing, and of how long that process is. And if you're not ready, you'll go under. The, the other thing to note with printing for brands like that is there's a couple things. There's compliance, first of all. Mm -hmm. The compliance is very, very deep. And more importantly than the compliance, you know, you think, well, if I just use the right products and send it out, that's fine. These companies audit you yeah, at least once a year. And sometimes if you're lucky, they'll, they'll do it every other year. But so they're going to audit everything. So you can't just have chemicals you shouldn't be using that are on their banned substance list and just tuck it away in the back corner. No, it cannot be there because they're going to come into your shop mm -hmm. and they look through every corner and they will pull. Uh, random selections of employees and take them up and have one-on-ones with them and ask them questions. I mean, I've had some, I've had employees come back to me and at, and tell me the questions they ask them. And a lot of times they're asking them questions about me as their manager. And you're sure. like, wow, I cannot, that's an incredibly personal question. I can't believe they asked you that, <laughs> but you got to be prepared for all these scenarios when you yeah. print for big companies like that. Yeah, so the, the companies that I've run, we're we printed for a lot of big brands like McDonald's and whatever. And we were always doing Nike safety and social compliance, mm -hmm. usually with Bureau Bureau Veritas or people like yes. that. <laughs> and they would come out once a year. And my goal was no findings. I want all green. That's right. And I was a stickler for stuff and I was always doing things. And I had a really well trained staff and mm -hmm. Because I didn't want any problems at all. No, nope. right? <laughs> yeah. where me getting into the sustainability arena solved a whole bunch of that stuff because it's all about improving your process and documentation and da 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 da. If, if you and, stay ahead of the curve on the compliance and you're using stuff that is actually ethical and good for the environment, it is so much easier to oh, be yeah. ahead of those audits right. too. So it, that, it just all goes hand in hand together. Yeah. yeah that's why I got into bi uh, bioremediation, right? That's mm -hmm. why I got into that and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so Ray has a really great thing. So if your Delta E is off by a point, for instance, dead on A and B and off on the L, it'll be noticeable by the I. So if you're, a, you're not a Photoshop geek, what this means is, okay, your L channel is the lightness channel, and that is the contrast channel. In fact, it's my favorite way to build an underbase is use the, uh, uh, the lightness channel and invert it. It's almost there, a quick curve, and you're done, right? The A and B channel is basically RGB. It's just broken into two channels instead of three. Um, and if you've ever messed around with curves on the A and B channel, uh, you know that just a slight shift completely changes the whole damn thing. <laughs> Yeah. And so uh, it's just one of these things where uh, this is it, you getting into the geeky side of the science mm -hmm. color can serve you really well. And if you, and this is where knowing photo, Photoshop can be your friend. <laughs> For sure. So um, well, the, the scary part, I remember Abercrombie telling me that the reason they're such sticklers is that, and they were pretty proud of this is that you'll never see one of their, prints in a in a discount bend now working with nate and that and hearing that color is subjective to the merchandiser boy wouldn't a tool like that have just been really isn't yeah. that subjective where you have things right. down uh, right. would make things so much easier absolutely so we have some great comments that i've been skipping over yeah, so i want to get, get, get yeah. to them right so william says hey uh, Matt says, Shirt Lab was great in Columbus. Thank you for attending, Matt. Appreciate you, buddy. Uh, Cora says, it's really cold in Centuria. <laughs> Somebody on Facebook wants a beard. We got to tell you who, the, you got to tell us who you are. <laughs> uh, Mark says, documentation of the print parameters is key as well as crock and wash test. Another great fact, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. 
How many shops out there don't have a washing machine or a dryer in your shop, right? You can get one of those apartment ones. They're mm -hmm. just yep. tiny. They stack on top of each other, right? I wash stuff regularly. I don't print for brands of that level anymore. And we still wash stuff. You know, at the very large facility, we had a washer and dryer there and a full-time QA person. And uh, that's a whole other step with working for those big brands. We had to document hourly QA procedures and keep them that, that wow. they had been checked and things were coming out and they were matching and tolerance has been checked. And so that's a whole nother level. When you get audited, they may go, uh, well, we need to see, see the, the documentation from this run back in March of a year ago. And you can either be, uh-oh, or here you go. No problem. Here's the folder. Yeah. So Yosa says he wants to see your documenting sample. Is okay. there any way you can share that and include a drive link in the okay. YouTube comments and that way people can download it? Yep, I can do that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ray says, shows the closest Pantones. Jeremy says, whoa, Delta E, not sure what that is, but he, he sounds like he needs it. Yeah. yeah. And for Jeremy, for you, you do so many things with brands and branding and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think that would be a good tool for you if you're really hyper vigilant about your Panto match. If mm -hmm. close is okay, then the, you're it's a bazooka trying to kill a fly. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, we did that one. Uh, knowing we did that one too. What's the best before date on a color book? It has to change by time. You should really change those yearly. Yeah, that's that's that that's the rule. I wasn't sure. Yeah. I'm like change them regularly. <laughs> that yeah. that's the main thing. Well, you know, you, you know, at the very least, once every two years. Yeah, you know, like because they're hundred. What are they? One hundred and thirty dollars ish now, right? Yeah, they're, so, they're fairly expensive. And um, but yeah, I but if, if you use it all the, the time. I just wish you could just buy it. the coded version and not have to buy the set, and it's half the price. Right. right? <laughs> so, Bruce says hello from Arizona. Hey, Bruce, mm -hmm. I'm in Arizona. We're all envious of you. Yeah. Um, we would always view the garments and prints in the same light as the brand's retail shops. Minimalism can be your worst enemy. So, what is the temperature of that bulb? I think that's important. Oh, yeah. Um, being an ink slapper is looking better and better listening to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Any recommended resources to learn more about LAB? Uh, just, I think that you can just Google Photoshop. I'm sure they have lots of tutorials. Hey, there was some great articles. It seems like about two years ago on that. And I'd have to look them back up. Or now. mess around with it. I've got a blog article I did on it. Let me Google that up real quick. I called it uh, LAB Lab Mojo or something. What did I call it? Say that, yeah. I remember a couple years ago. Really, it seemed like people were starting to look at using that. Mm -hmm. I, I've been using it all, you know, a long time ago. I'm mm -hmm. an old guy. I took a uh, class uh, from member Seabold. Remember that company? It was a training company. Yep. I did a class for a whole week on Photoshop in Boston, and that's why I learned about LAB and the. And the people that were teaching the class were the people who were writing the code for Photoshop. It was amazing. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, cool. So uh, Russell Brown was one of them. So here's uh, that article. It's called Lab go. Mode Mojo. I wrote it uh, 2016. <coughs> uh, it's a good article. It's got a picture of a tiger on it. So uh, enjoy. All right, so um, where are we here? So what's, we've we've done the whole show on one topic. Maybe we should go to yeah, something else. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> creating SOPs and training. Okay, creating SOPs and training, I am adamant about, because there should be a documented procedure to everything. Uh, so... Back in the day, I used to always write everything down and then make it into documents. And if it was just daily procedures, I would always print them out and make signs of it that went up on all the walls. Um, and I've always had, when it comes to training people, everybody learns a little differently. Even though most printers are visual people, you still got to understand that everybody learns differently. So I would always 
hand them a document of whatever it was we were training and learning about. I would train them and teach them one-on-one, -on -one, and then I would audibly speak it to them as well. Uh, that way they heard all modes of it. But really more than anything else, when we get to the training side, more than the SOPs, uh, I always wanted people to be hands-on and see it a ton of times. Like I just read something recently. It said people don't really get or aren't really listening to what you're saying till they've heard it the ninth or tenth time. Mm -hmm. Which would you say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so uh, from a management standpoint, that's that's frustrating because I'm like, I'm a guy that like, I want you to tell me something once, maximum twice, and I intend to move on it. But understanding that that is how employees are going to be is key. So you got to go over it with them. So once you have a good culture and team built up in your shop, I've always been a fan of promoting within and bringing everybody on as a catcher. Everybody starts out as a catcher and we bump you up internally. And so if you do that, everyone's cross-trained, but it also starts them at a, at a low factor that then isn't quite as crucial yet. Every you know, link in the chain is crucial, but it, it keeps the, uh, the risk a bit lower starting them as a catcher. And as you train them and you can give them a little bit more leash, you can start bumping them up then as their performance dictates it. Uh, something we do now that I own my own shop, I talk about this a lot. The people we hire now and will be hiring are probably roughly around my age and younger. You know, who are those people predominantly? Not to be discriminatory, but just looking at the people we have coming in and who, especially as future goes to, who are they going to be? They're, they're probably going to be in their early to mid 30s and younger. So they're millennials and later on. How are those guys communicating? Okay, there I can give them written documents and books, and it probably isn't, it's probably never gonna get read. And that frustrates me from a management standpoint because I'm a reader, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it frustrates me. I gotta communicate with them on their level. So what we've started doing is taking videos of everything, absolutely Great. everything we it's do. Phone, right? Yep, that's it. I mean, and just we we have a bank of videos that we're building. And so, you know, when I bring in part-timers or new people now, I, I show them, here's where to find these videos. Just start watching them at home. Start getting integrated and involved and seeing how we're doing it. And they'll watch that. Yep. The other thing I do, uh, I, there's a couple books that I really want everybody to listen to. But oh, here, here comes Richard Grease's favorite book, I bet. No, two yeah. of them. I'm going to mention your favorite book and Richard's favorite <laughs> book. It's coming. It's coming because they're my two favorite as well. But... I want everyone to read them and I would gladly buy them that book and give it to them, but I know they won't read it. So what can I do now? Well, number one, build your culture to show that what you're speaking, what you're saying is important and back it up. So that part that they do listen when you say this is important. But after that, now we have started playing audiobooks in the shop and I start giving those people, we just play them as we're working. So of course my two don't, don't make me uh Sam, but we got extreme ownership, man. I, I, I want everybody to listen Woo. to that in the world. And uh, then two second lean, there's there's your Richard Green's ones. And those are the two uh, most transformative books, at least for my shop. And so uh, they both have easy, and, and, actionable and, and steps. And why, Ray, why? Why are they? Well, extreme ownership is just great for everyone to take responsibility and work as a team. And it's all encompassing. It's great for your life. It, it will make you a better person on all levels if you can understand the principles of, of it. Two second lean I like because it is easy for an hourly worker to understand and take actionable steps. So two second lean is just about lean culture. If you've been involved in 5S or Lean Six Sigma or you know any of those buzzwords we've heard thrown around a lot. And if you've been around very long, they almost get lost in the shuffle and you almost it's kind of like, yeah, 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 whatever. I know we're gonna make an outline around our scissors and we're supposed to put the scissors back there, but you know, what's in, but uh, two second lean really makes it uh, brings it home, but makes it really easy and actionable. Any hourly employee can listen to that. And all of a sudden they're going, oh, yeah, I can do this. I can I can do that every day and look for that little tiny improvement that over the course of of years and weeks and time adds up to massive savings and massive efficiency. You yep. learned a lot of this with and started a lot of this when you were printing for the brands at that shop, you now own your own shop and have incorporated all of this in, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. And just so people don't, you're not what people would consider a massive shop. You're not running 
three autos of 16 colors and stuff. But the importance of just building your business and doing things correctly, you have create you have in, implemented these into your culture, correct? Yeah, we so we do those exact same things now. So I, I mean, I have no problem sharing this information. We ran sixty two thousand prints last year. Great, you know, compared to where I came from of one point two million a year, that's <laughs> nothing. You know, we look at sixty two thousand. Oh, that's a week and a half worth of work. Um, you know, but but that's the whole thing. We are now working with a lot higher margins. We're looked at more as consultants on our end, working with the customers so we can help them create their graphics and design it so it's more printable. You know, a lot of times we work with designers still, but they're graphic designers. So they come to us and we can help it fit into their budget, make it be more printer friendly so that it does print easily and print cheaply and print uh in a way that is exact every single time rather than just giving me an art. We got to figure out how to do it. It's kind of a reverse role now where they come to us and, and ask for our input into it. So now that we're able to do that and, and be more on that end of it with them, it's, it's become this whole environment of collaboration versus just being under the thumb of a big brand. And so we like that. We're able to uh, definitely mark that up as well. And so we don't have to run the kind of units that uh, we used to have to, but um, certainly having those efficiencies helps us as well now that we're not running as much. Great. And, and so when we're training our employees, you know, how do you know that the knowledge is sticking? What do you do, Nate? Unfortunately, you can't always know. I, I'm like asking my guys questions all the time and I don't know if they even notice it sometimes, but like topic. And they just, just do this. Well, I know they, they have to wrong? answer or I'll just keep badgering them if they don't answer. But I'll literally ask them a question that's something from a day or two ago to see if they were, were picking up on. I'll see if they can answer right away or not. And, uh, but really, you don't know. So a lot of things that I talk about, or this is an example I use oftentimes with employees. And this is kind of weird. It's, it's like having a sheep in a pasture. I grew up on a farm, if you can't tell. It's like having a sheep in a pasture. And, and when I'm not sure <laughs> about, about that, that sheep or that employee first, I, I put them in kind of a smaller pen to see how they're going to react. But I still have nice defined parameters. That's the fence. So they, they know where we stand. They know what their job is. They know what it is they're supposed to do. But they don't know the size of the pen I've put them in. I've just put them there. They're just, they just know they're in the pen and where, where the, the gates are. So And I let them move freely amongst that. Now, as I see them start answering those questions from things we just covered, and as they get a little bit more time under the belt, okay, I start moving those fences out a little bit. Mm. And then I see how they react. You know, do they run through the fence? Do they, you know, and so if, if all of a sudden we, we go, oh, a lot of failure, okay, let me just bring the fences back in a little bit and, and try again and keep training, keep building them. And so every single employee has that different parameter and different expectations around them. And that's all based off of their performance and just a lot of times how much they get it. But more importantly, it's usually how well I did in training them and setting that, that culture and that environment with them. So it's, it's much on uh, them as it is me to make them successful. Um, but that's an easy way and an analogy that I use a lot is, is you set these little parameters. And if you're not sure or you think they've achieved what they've set out to in the first one, just give them a little bit more. That doesn't mean tear down the fences and let them run wild. Just give them a little bit more and see how they perform, you know, in small increments. That way you can mitigate the risk. Right. That's that's good. That's good stuff. So um, Ray says written SOP save time, helps with training, and allows you to take a vacation day once in a while. <laughs> right. And uh, right. Dan Daniel says, LAB, great value right there. Is that a pun value? And then uh, two second lean, he's got a big heart. So we all love that. Um, cool. So let's get to our third topic because we got 10 minutes left, which is culture of learning the new. So uh, this is something that I wanted to talk about today because something just happened yesterday, which was with uh, SNS Active, where they had their virtual event. I presented at that, and before our show started, uh, Nate and I were talking about that event and what we liked about it and that kind of stuff. So I think how we're learning right now in this industry is changing. Earlier this week, I was participating in a – actually, it was a global thing. We had people in all countries attend this 
little micro learning event that was like uh, three days this week. And I've been doing that all week. And I've got a whole notebook full of just mind blowing, awesome stuff. And if I didn't attend that, I wouldn't be thinking about this stuff at all. And I think we have to set up these opportunities in front of us to learn new things, even if we don't know anything about it and you're not in confusing, right? Mm -hmm. Putting yourself in that opportunity allows you to like, oh yeah, what, you know, like for example, there was a speaker yesterday that was talking about deep fakes, which is how they got uh, uh, technology and automation and stuff where they can fake any video, any picture, your voice, your sound, anything. You don't even have to be there. And, and so the question was like, how is that going to impact marketing? How is that going to impact uh, uh, security, right? Because they could take your face and put it in a porno, right? Mm -hmm. Or a, a world leader, you, you can make, they can be making a speech and you don't even know it's not them, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the whole discussion. And I found it so interesting. So for you, Nate, yesterday was the SNS activewear event. What did you think about it? What did you learn? And how are you also doing other things where you're putting yourself in front of learning opportunities? What are you doing? Well, okay. First and foremost, the SNS event I think was great. Um, <clears throat> and I think we've all t attended a ton of virtual events now. And I think within our industry, uh, they may have set a little bit of a standard now for what uh, a successful virtual event looks like. The uh, the platform and, and ease of it from a user and attendee was was great. Um, and I had a lot of conversations with people in the chats, even that I'd never met before. And so in that sense of it, it was similar to attending um, an in-person trade show and being able to just meet and collaborate with people that you normally wouldn't. So that was very interesting and good job to s, &S. I mean, great event. Um, as far as now <clears throat> trying to learn new things, well, first of all, you got to be just involved, number one, in your industry and always be paying attention to what's going on. But was, and specifically when we're in the industry, this, you guys know this industry is very small and most people are very helpful and collaborative. And, you know, I was scared of these things. I know initially when I got in, but just reach out to people, start reaching out to anyone, you know, anybody watching this, I'm no genius by any stretch, but you know, reach out to me. Any, any information or knowledge I have, I am more than willing to share. And most people are, but we're really scared initially because other industries are very big and not as collaborative as that. You know, I know, for years, I always wanted to talk to lawn winners. That was my big thing when I first got into this, and I was afraid to just approach him. Um, so, so just get involved in the industry and start talking to people, and don't be afraid because everyone's—I've never been hit over the head with a bat by anyone yet. Um, so that's <laughs> that's one thing. But another thing, I was telling you guys before uh, that I've specifically looked at a lot more in the most recent years is I started attending other events that aren't just in the industry and other trade shows to try and see what are they doing? What are they doing different? What are ways I can learn from other manufacturing systems? You know, whether whether we feel as a lot of printers think we're in this big artistic space, but realistically we're in more of an, an industrial manufacturing space. So can I go to other factories and shops and learn from them and see what kind of things they're implementing to pick up and, and take little tidbits back and now implement in my shop? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that's that's a big thing for me, but and then after that, you just got to start diving in. Uh, we One thing we dove into recently, I guess not recently, it's been almost two years ago now, but is HSA printing. Because, you know, whether we like it or not, in-press DTG is coming. That is the future. I mean, I, I really believe that. So, so to make it easier on yourself now, start learning HSA printing and water-based printing. That way, when that time comes, you, you've already conquered that part of it and now it just is the other portion that you're putting into it so we print i don't know i, I need to check uh some metrics and see but i would speculate 50 to 60 percent of our prints are now all hsa and before that i was 100 percent plastisol shop you know i didn't i really was intimidated for the most part by water-based all i had ever used was some some low solid stuff way back in the day and and i about lost my mind doing that um without having people tend every single screen so just things like that, the, the hit those people in your industry, look at people outside the industry to see what they're doing. And then once you kind of gather that information, just, just dive in and, and there's going to be mistakes and there's going to be stumbling blocks, but, 
that is part of it. But but talk to the guys, talk to the guys that have come before you, because often you find they've done that research. I mean, we've mentioned Richard Greaves already here, but you know, I go back to him all the time when I can't find information on something that that I think is to me is new at least. And I go, Richard, do you know anything about this? You got an article on this? And he's like, Oh yeah, here's an article from 1984. I'm like, yeah. Okay, it's already been done. Awesome. Good for me. I don't have to beat my head into the wall trying to figure it out. So so go back and talk to those guys that have that information. That way, yeah. the things we're moving forward on truly is new stuff and new evolutions of that instead of just hitting stuff that's already been done. Yeah, this is the exact reason why we started Shirt Lab is to promote education, promote best practices, promote uh, 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 a safe place to learn. And there's a tribe of like-minded professionals where uh, if you post something, you don't get slammed because, you know, in some groups, especially Facebook, if you yeah. post something, you're going to be, you know, they you, they jump on you because you're an idiot, right? Yeah. And, and so, or you got to wade through the, poli the all the political stuff that's always there. And, and so uh, our group, uh, yeah, you got to pay to belong, but it's safe. It's professionals. All right. the best people are in there. And we're all about fostering the education and doing stuff. I don't make this commercial, but you know that's the reason we cr created it. It was because there just wasn't stuff out there for that. Right. And um, and I'm a big believer in education, and I, I I do things myself. You know, like the thing I just did this week. Um, and uh, when I was running shops, one of the things I always belonged to was either the area or the state manufacturing association. Mm -hmm. Because they have free, usually for free, people will come out to your shop and teach you process, Lean mm -hmm. Six Sigma, all this kind of stuff, workflow thing. I also was able, to, I got, I was talking to this to somebody the other day. I bet I have acquired about $150,000 worth of grants, free money for things through these association memberships. One of which was an $80,000 grant to buy a Cornette Avalanche printer, okay, because of because of that, right? It wouldn't have happened any other way. And I had to, I had to fill out a form. To <laughs> you know? I filled a form out and got $80,000, mm -hmm. okay? So it's like it, there was more to it than that. I'm oversimplifying. But, but you see what I'm saying here. You have to put yourself out there and network. And I think the people like you and the shops like yours that are like investing in themselves and looking at things and networking and trying to do better and pushing the envelope, they're the ones that are, are going to be so far ahead of other people because they're going to have that knowledge and that competitive advantage. Um so kudos to you for doing all yeah, that. I mean, work, work with your uh, your ink and chemical guys too, you know? I mean, talk yeah, to them and work with them and, and have them, when something's new, have them send it out to your shop. Try it out. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of that as far as like new products and giving feedback to the manufacturers so they can adjust as well. Um, but, but get those new products and try them out. And, yeah. you know, I think Alan will say all the reps are more than friendly and willing to help you. Absolutely. Alan, but how even, often does somebody call you up and go, Hey, um, I got this thing. I don't even know what I'm doing. Right? That happens all the time with you, doesn't it? It actually never does. I wish they would. It's always I'm, I'm doing wrong? this. I'm doing this. Do you have anything better? I wish it would be more of I, I am lost. Every one. I shouldn't say never. Every once in a while, it does. And then it's a point of are they willing to listen? And you know, we were talking earlier. Marshall about pain points. And I think sometimes we have as human beings, as business people, our pain threshold is too high. And it is when that pain point, when you're all of a sudden bleeding from your jugular, then you're going to call out for help and you're willing. Your pain point doesn't need to be that high. Um, I wish people would call more and say, hey, here's what I'm doing. I, it's working okay, but I'm not sure this is the best process. And yeah. I don't know if they're afraid because it's going to be a sales job. And I know that's always a, an issue and stuff, but hopefully in my career, I've found that if I can help with the process, then the products will come behind it. Um, oh. Nate uh, has tested products for us. We have, he just 
did a video on a product we have 601 that is coming out and it's out now, but it's going to be coming out more because it is great for removing stains for HSA and discharge. Mm -hmm. So who do we have to it? Nate, here it is. I had him the product. He did it. And he goes, I'm going to be honest with it. Oh no, we can't have that. And the, that's the, exactly the thing with the, with the products too is, you know, you guys are always making new stuff and developing. And so many times you'll see a shop that's using a product that's 20 years old. And it's not that it was bad 20 years ago, but you guys are developing and making new things for a reason. And, and they're, they're safer. The compliance is better, but generally the performance is better too. So you got to get out there and keep pushing. And so that's why the first thing I ask you guys, when you come into my shop, I go, what's new? Cause I yeah. want to use what's the newest and the best. Yep. Well, well, also the, the the inks that you're using are changing. The fabrics that we're printing on are yes. changing. The presses that we're using are changing. Everything is changing. So if you're using an older consumable, right, it, you got to like lift your head up and observe and like what else is out there. You know, the the the, the, the it's yeah. funny you when know, I talk to some people sometimes. I go, why I ask them why? Why do you do that? And what's the answer? You know what the you know what the answer is, Alan. What's the answer? I'm sorry, I wasn't I was looking at something else. Give me the question. It's, it's the it, well, it, it's the way we've always done it, right? Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. don't confuse me with facts, my this is, this is the way we've always done it, yeah. right? And that that it could be fine, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a better way out, right? right? And, Absolutely. You know, and I think the other thing with manufacturers sometimes. You know, we are cost effective, want to be cost effective. <laughs> you got to love muscle, Donic. Um, Absolutely. You know, for us, we're coming up with new products. One, we want to be compliant. But sometimes when we've developed a product that has worked well, those um, raw materials that went into it could have been very affordable at the time. And doesn't mean they're not compliant now. But now things change and market changes with your manufacturer. Oh, the products that went into those are now out, outrageously priced. So unless you want your product to go increase 75%, we're creating newer products to right. work. So there's just a lot of it that goes into. And we need those things tested. We'll test them some ourselves. But when I have someone, the reason when I talk to my boss about I want to get with Nate and have him test this is one, I know Nate's background. Two, I know he's not going to, you know, just whip it on there and say, no, it works. It doesn't work. He's going to give us real feedback. And he has SOPs in his shop. It's real yeah. world SOPs on there. And for me, Nate, I think I told you this is, and I was talking to a guy, you know, uh, this week real well, Rob Coleman mm -hmm. for, um, yeah. from there. And Rob and I Rob were talking great. about, what's yeah, that? He's, he's scared to come on this show. Oh, yeah, come can, on. You can sing. <laughs> So he knows that he, um, but, I'm teasing. Rob's awesome. But you know, one of the things, Nate, yes, you are a younger guy, but what did I tease you about earlier on the phone? Hey, when Marshall and I are dead and gone, you're the rock star, man, because you're not afraid to go. We were actually talked. You're not afraid to call Richard and say, what do you know? Tell me the mistakes you made. Right. You don't <laughs> want to hit those pitfalls and you've never been that way. Right. And I think that puts you well above. You're not afraid to reach out to Marshall going, hey, Shirt Lab, let's pitch Columbus. I don't know you guys real well. Here's the reason. I didn't know Nate at all. No. Well, I knew him a little bit because you asked me. And uh, we talked on Messenger about some yeah. stuff, about wanting to get more involved in the industry. And I think it's great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So that's, a, that's my kudos to you. Well, let me tell you, this has been the fastest hour I think we've ever had here. I can't believe it's already our time's about up. I want to get to some comments real quick, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. So uh, Ray said he learned LED mode from Kudre in a seminar in 1995. I won't, this is I won't tell you how old I was in 1995. How old were you in 1995? <laughs> ripe old age of eight. Great. <laughs> Note to self, no more Nate Lubber on <laughs> Got it. Right. Uh, and then uh, we'll just scroll down a little bit. Heather says SNS Activewear was a great event. And uh, I think I sent you a, a note, Heather, that said hello yesterday. Uh, I, I skipped out early. I don't know if you were responded <laughs> or not. James says it was a cool event. I totally agree. Um, and then um, uh, Jeremy says HS, HSA has been a huge learning curve to design for. 
Uh, would love to get more into that. We're just out of time. Yeah. And then Ray says, this year we all got deep into LinkedIn learning. Unbelievable yeah. amount of subjects available. That's great. And There are a ton uh, of resources on there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so before we go here, let's uh, – here's your – email address and if anybody has a question or anything they can reach out to you right nate yep absolutely shoot me an email anytime of course i am a millennial so if you contact us on instagram or facebook at lever design and print we will certainly reply to that too so uh if, if you can find a platform we're on we will get back to you if it's electronic so yeah um any last minute words of what from either one of you guys? Well, we got a couple more comments that just came up. I think we need to. Hold on. Marshall Photoshop, what display when you start? I don't know. <laughs> I don't understand the question. I think he's asking when you started, Marshall, what Photoshop was around. I got into the industry in 1993. And uh, at the time, I was, I had my own apparel company doing fraternity and sorority shirts when I was working on my master's degree in architecture and I was doing everything by hand, doing blue lines <laughs> and using a stack camera. And the guy that was printing my shirts was co-owned by an ad agency. And they said, Hey, this new thing came out. <laughs> you got to learn how to use it. We're thinking about getting rid of the stack camera and using this thing called Photoshop. And uh, so I don't know what version what it was, but it was really early. I was uh, I used to have a proportion wheel. I still had uh, some around or somewhere, but I don't want to see doing all letter set rub down letters. It was oh. crazy old. I'm crazy old, Yosta. So letter um, set and chart pack. Yeah. So it, oh, yeah, so what? How I I taught myself how to use it, and I. Um, by recreating designs I had already completed by hand and which used to take me all day. And then I learned how to do it. And it's like in an hour, I'm done. What? <laughs> it was like mind blowing. So yeah. I, I, I uh, never went back to graduate school and I started becoming an art director in 1993. And that's how I officially got into the industry. So, uh, mm. Anyway, and then uh, Ruble says, hello, Alan, and everyone from Bangladesh. Well, Ruble so, was on last yeah, week. Silicon yeah. market and future possibilities. Well, it, you need to go back and rewatch the one we did with Dan Solomon. When was that, Alan? Uh, we never had him on. Oh, I had him on my Forward Progress show. We did. So, Dan's on the list to get on here. Nate, have you worked with Silicon at all? I did. Um, let me – oh, boy, I got to try and figure – remember this. I believe it was December – of 2017, I did 93,000 tote bag handles in silicone ink. Uh huh. So uh, yeah, we ran some silicone. I like it. And under, if you understand it, understand the properties of it, and most importantly, understand the best way to apply it onto the garment and what garments it works with, it is a beautiful product. I mean, yeah. amazing. I um because Dan Solomon's up here in Michigan and we talk quite a bit and I listen to everything he says intently. Um, so, and from what I've seen, silicone is a great product. It, it reminds me of water base 10 years ago. Everybody's afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. <laughs> it's it's, just it's a matter of understanding yep. what it, what substrate it goes on to. And then um, after that, it's just catalysts and basic stuff like that. But yep. once you kind of understand how it works and how it prints and the, mat down or lack of mat down properties with it. it it's not that scary but just just dive in the, the the pot time on them is fairly long so yeah it's not as hard to learn as other things seem the the technology's gotten become become big in the last uh it's really increased so i think it's great uh ruble so i would reach out to dan solomon i think i sent yeah. you his email um for the possibilities there in bangladesh is the only one i know of uh, Here's really the interview I did with him. If you can sure. screenshot that, because I just quickly copied it. <laughs> so it's YouTube gibberish. Yep. Um, and then uh, who else? Some last other thing. Uh, oh, um, Heather's coming by your shop, uh, Nate. 
Oh, stop on by. Yeah, anybody's more than welcome. Uh, if you if you want a million square foot facility, you probably won't be impressed because we, <laughs> we are we're just little. But uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, we make a lot of really cool stuff. So anybody's <laughs> welcome. A Mark, great microbrewery right down the road. Absolutely, you and I have yep. been there. Mark, <laughs> uh, good yep. stuff. Stay warm. Yosta says display was the name before Photoshop. Oh, mm. I, that I did not know. So uh, good, good stuff from everyone. Um, so anyway, thank everyone for watching. We appreciate you. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Nate. You were awesome. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. And if you need to get a hold of Nate, get a hold of him. Feel free easy to, to. Easy to reach. Don't call them. Email them. <laughs> Instagram. You, you can try, but I might not pick up. Yeah. <laughs> I usually have to text you. Yeah. yeah. All right, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend, and we'll check you out next week. By the way, I'm not going to be on the show next week. Who is – do we have a guest host? We do. I have the Scott Fresner coming. Ooh. So we're going from Nate Lubber, who's going to take over the industry we're gone, to Scott Fresner, who – I'm excited about talk about a guy that has brought more products into the industry. OG um, big time. OG I've taken his time. classes. Yeah. So uh really I'm, bummed I, won't be Scott on. <laughs> I'm so I'm bummed I won't be here. <laughs> yeah, well that's why I get to have mine because you're there. And then yeah. then week after that, who do we have, Marshall? Uh where's my list? We've got uh Mark Granberry. Mark Granberry, the owner of Graphic Solutions. I am very excited. We have him set up. Joe Piazza from Caesar after that. Justin Lawrence hey. from Oklahoma Shirt Company. Hey, Greg Kitson. Greg Kitson. I got uh I gotta set up some things with um Simon uh Clifford from Yeah, uh, we're good. We were talking about it, it adhesives and talk about something that is a commodity almost people think of when they're really not. And uh, I think that's going to be a good show. Oh, here you go. So uh, Jeremy wants to do an episode on HUSA versus Plastisol. Hey, Nate, maybe we can have you back and we can have a whole discussion on that. Okay. I think I'm, we should I'm get Nate and then maybe grab Dan Ray. Solomon. Yeah. We get Ray on. That would be fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that would be – Ray, I think, would be fun to have on anyway. We could have, like, the yeah. battle of the beards. <laughs> Ray, Ray I, I lose, Nate. But, yeah. So if this was instead of three, it would be quarters. Just imagine how much smaller we're going to look. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> okay. And then um, Yosta says, can't wait. Thank you, Yosta. And then uh, Ruble says, you guys are awesome. Keep it up. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks a lot, everybody. All right. Well, hey, we're, we're in way over bonus time situation, so we got to go. Uh, and thanks. Have a fantastic weekend, and we'll check you next time. Be safe, everyone.